All right, hello everyone. This is Professor Ryan Paul. Uh, thank you for watching. This is a short video about how to write about plot, how to write, essentially how to write a plot summary using the story The Jewelry by Guy de Maupassant as our example. So just to review, of course, what plot is, it's the arrangements of the events in a story. It's what happens in a story. Uh, but it's the order in which the events are told not necessarily the order in which the events happened. Sometimes they can be told in a different order than in which they happened. And there's an implied logic in the plot. There's an implied uh, cause and effect or a meaning suggested by the plot. So by understanding how and why the events happen, we can understand the story better. So when you're writing about plot, just some basic things to think about. First, what are the details that you want to include, which you're going to have to ask yourself what is most important in the story versus what is least important in the story. And you're going to have to think about the logic of the story. Why do things happen in the way that they do? Why do the events turn out the way they do? What is the reason behind that? So let's talk about plot summary. First off, take a second to look at this list of qualities and ask yourself, when you're thinking about a summary, you have to write a summary of a story or an article or anything that you've read, what qualities do you associate with a summary? Looking at these here, which ones describe a summary and which ones do not? So. A summary is something that is, hopefully you've, you've picked out these terms, a summary is something that's concise, that means it's, it's, it's to the point, it's selective, it only includes what's most important. Summaries are brief, at least relative to the original text. Summaries provide you an overview, a bird's eye view of what you're looking at, and they only hit the highlights. So these are the, the most important qualities that one would associate with a summary. Let's just look at definitions briefly. Um, the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, defines summarize, the act of summarize, as to state briefly or succinctly. So when I'm asking you to summarize the plot of something, I want you to state it briefly or succinctly. Also, according to the OED, uh, the word summary itself uh, is something that is containing or comprising the chief points or the sum and substance of a mat matter. Compendious, now usually with the implication of brevity. So the chief points, the main ideas, and brief. And finally, this is from uh, a student's guide to first year writing, a book about uh, freshman writing. Summary is defined as a concise statement of a text's main ideas written, and here's a very important uh, caveat here, or important qualification, written in the reader's own words. So a summary is something that you write in your own words about another text. So what are the key features of a summary? Well, some of the key features of a summary, its purpose is, again, to provide an overview of the text, a bird's eye view a glimpse of the whole at one shot rather than all the details. It condenses the source down to its most main ideas, its crucial ideas. A summary eliminates most of the details, right? A lot of the specifics are gonna be gone because there's just not room for them if we're trying to get an overview. And a summary is going to be usually much shorter than the original, so very brief at least compared to the original text that was written. Also, again, a summary is in your own language and with minimal use or no use of direct quotation from the text you're quoting. So it's your words, not just taking things from the text that's written. And, and this is particularly, this last point is particularly important if you're writing about, for example, an article or a scholarly source or a newspaper or an opinion, if you're providing a summary of something non-fictional, you want to provide a balanced, clear presentation of the source's ideas. So if you're doing research, for example, and you're summarizing different arguments that people are making 
in the case of a, uh, to, to make a certain case, you want to be balanced and clear even if you disagree with the source. Of course, that is again most important when thinking about non-fictional uh, summary, summarizing non-fictional or research materials. Now, what is the work of a plot summary? What is it if we're talking about summarizing a story? How is that a little bit different? Well, again, it's to provide an overview of the story as a whole. That's what it does. And it highlights the important elements of the story. So what are the key events? Who are the key characters? Those are the things that are most important. Plot summary also shows cause and effect or other structuring principles of the story. That is, it tells us it explains or it shows how things happen and why things happen in the story and if there's anything particularly notable about the way the story is told, how the events are arranged. And a plot and the plot summary will suggest either implicitly, that is by implying, by not stating openly, or it might explicitly state what you think the central meaning or theme of the story is, that is what the story is about beyond the literal events that happen. So these are the things that, that's the work of a plot summary, what a plot summary does. So questions to consider. First thing to consider when you're writing a plot summary or thinking about the plot of a story is what do you want to say about it? What do you think it's about? And this is beyond the literal story to the ideas and themes beyond uh, what's, what's actually happening. So to take an example, Sonny's Blues, a story that we're reading this week, in which the literal story is about a man meeting up or, or reuniting with his uh, brother, estranged brother. And so that's literally what happens. But we can also think about beyond that to a, a larger level, a more abstract level. This is a story about family and reconciliation and a story about misunderstandings between families and how those misunderstandings are healed. It's a story about how time can pull people apart and then bring them back together. Right? These are all things that it's about in a larger, more abstract way than the literal story of a man who finds out his brother has been arrested for drugs and then helps his brother get off drugs. Right? That's literally what happens, but beyond that it's about reconciliation and family and so forth. Another question to consider, what's the logic or principle that governs the story. That is, why do things happen the way they do? Where does it begin? Where does it end? And how does it get here? So you ask yourself, what's the status quo at the beginning of the story? What's the world like? And how has it changed through the story? Why has it changed? Again, to go to Sonny's Blues, we can think about the principle, the logic of poverty, right? These are characters that grew up in an impoverished area and the desire to be free to escape from their poverty that's an important principle that's an important logic in the story and that's one of the things that causes people to behave in the way they do their situation their setting the lives that they've been raised in and their desire to escape from those lives so that's some of the logic that governs it another logic that governs Sonny's Blues is love and families care for each other, the way people care for other members of their family. That's one of the things that causes the reconciliation to occur. So think about what happens and why. Other questions. What are the most important details to include? And what details can you omit without affecting the clarity of your summary? So what is necessary to understand what happens? Again, you can't put everything in a summary, otherwise you'd just be retelling the story. So what can you leave out and what can you include? And what, ha what do you have to include? So to think about Sonny's Blues, you might leave out the very brief encounter when the narrator meets up with one of Sonny's old friends. It's not a super important moment in the, in the narrative. It happens at the very beginning and he happens to run into an old friend of Sonny's and he talks to him about him briefly, that might not be an important detail to include, but you probably would want to include something about the encounter with uh, the memory that the narrator has about his mother and at his father's funeral. 
and what his mother says to him there about watching out for his brother. That would be an important detail, probably, whereas another one might not be as important a detail given the main ideas you're trying to communicate about the story. And if the story is told in a non-chronological order, which Sonny's Blues is, right? Some of the stories that we read are told straight from beginning to end, but others, they might jump around in their time scheme. Sonny's Blues is one. A Rose for Emily is another story like that. If it's told non-chronologically, is it more effective if I relate the events in the order that they're told, or do I rearrange them into chronological order? So for example, in Sonny's Blues, we learn about something that happened decades before the main part of the story. Would it be more effective to include that, that at the beginning of the summary or include it in the middle of the summary where it happens in the story? In that case, probably more effective to leave it in its non-chronological order. Whereas a story like A Rose for Emily might be more effective, perhaps, depending on what you wanted to communicate about it, to rearrange the events into chronological order. And finally, if there's a big surprise in the story, like A Rose for Emily, it has a big surprise as, as part of its uh, conclusion, is the summary more effective if I clearly explain the mystery at the beginning or if I maintain it until it occurs in the narrative? So if you were writing about A Rose for Emily, would it be more effective to begin the summary by announcing the big twist, the big surprise that we learn at the end of the story? Or would it make more sense to summarize the story and only reveal the big surprise at the end of your summary since it occurs at the end of the story? Um, is knowing the surprise necessary to understand the meaning of the story as a whole? All these questions that I've been asking, by the way, there are multiple ways to answer them. You might not you might not all have the same answers to these questions, even if you're writing about the same story. It's all a matter of interpretation and what you want to say about the story and your understanding of it. So let's talk about how to organize a plot summary. Um, you begin by stating the central idea of the narrative. What's the meaning that it demonstrates? And then you'll want to give a list of the essential events. You'll tell what happens. And here you want to make the choice. Do you put them in chronological or non-chronological order? You want to think about what the relationship between the events is and explain this clearly in your summary. So you look for obvious cause and effect patterns. Any other repetitive patterns or similarities, echoes, Look for irony. Is there anything ironic where one thing seems like it should happen, but an unexpected event happens instead? Are there reversals of status or fortune? And are there any figurative or symbolic meanings? Do any of the events seem to suggest or symbolize something beyond, again, their literal meaning, beyond the literal action that's occurred? List the essential characters and their important characteristics. This is going to be tied up with your discussion of the important events. You're going to also be saying who the main characters are and what's important about them. And, of course, you'll be talking about how they relate to one another and how the characters relate to the events. How do they cause certain things to happen? How do the events change the characters and their relationships to one another? What changes with the characters or between them as the story goes on. And then finally, if there are any other important details that you might want to include about the style or setting, anything else that's important to understanding what's happening in the story, you would also include them in your plot summary. So let's put this into practice and work on the jewelry by Guy de Maupassant. So let's, what is the main idea? What is, or what is a main idea about this story? Well, one of the things that the story seems to be about is about greed and the desire for money. That, that's throughout this short, very short story. And that greed does bad things to people. The desire for money, the pursuit of wealth at all costs has negative effects on people's lives. 
So I'm going to say that's the main idea. Very simple here, but that's our simple main idea. The jewelry is a story about how greed negatively affects lives. What are the essential events of the story? Well, Lanton, our main character, he meets a young woman and they get married. We learn that they enjoy a lot of financial success, despite the fact that he doesn't make a great deal of money. She starts to go to the theater a lot and she always buys fake jewelry, which he doesn't seem to like. And then she dies. He grieves over her death. He's very sad, almost dies himself out of grief. He becomes very poor. He suddenly cannot afford his life anymore without his wife helping him. He decides to sell the fake jewelry, and in doing so, he finds out that it's real. And at first, he's very upset about this, but once he realizes that it's worth a lot of money, he sells it all and demands as much for it as he can get. So he gets a lot of money from this supposedly fake jewelry that's actually real, and celebrates. And so... The end of the story ends with he's now rich, he gets married, but he's unhappy with his new life and his new wife. So who are the characters in this story? Uh, major characters. First, there's, of course, Lanton, who is a clerk. That's a sort of middle class job, right? He's involved with uh, copying documents for lawyers, things like that. He loves his beautiful young wife, but he hates her hobbies, in particular her hobby of going to the theater and buying fake jewelry. And the wife, we don't get a name for her. She's idealized. We know from the very beginning she's beautiful. Everyone thinks she's the perfect young woman. And she has a poor, she comes from a poor family. That's one of the reasons why she's looking to get married. She's very playful with her husband. We see that they like to play around a lot, and she manages the household exceptionally well. However, after she dies, there are some questions. He doesn't ever say it explicitly, but there are questions about her fidelity. Where did she actually get this jewelry from? And if there's something that defines her characteristic, it's her love of the theater and her love of the fake jewelry. The minor characters, not many, but there are a few other characters that are briefly mentioned. Um, there are the jewelers that Lanton goes to take the jewelry to. And they are the ones who reveal that it's real jewelry, that it's not fake. And, of course, we see that some laugh at him. And there's also the second wife, mentioned very briefly at the end of the story. And what do we know about her? Well, we know that she's very faithful and morally upstanding, but we also know that she's an unpleasant person. So she's sort of a contrast to the first wife. Some interrelated patterns. Well, we have Lanton's happiness and its relationship to his economic stance, status and his relationship to its marital status. So, for example, he is very happy when he is married to his first wife and has a decent economic situation. He's, he's doing well, uh, not rich, but he's okay financially. They're comfortable. So he's happy, happy and economically and married. Then he's sad, poor, and a widower. After his wife dies, he loses his happiness, he loses his economic status, and he's no longer married. And then how does it end? Well, he's married again, and now he's rich, but he's very unhappy. So we see complex interrelationship between these three aspects of Lanton's life. Another pattern, and also a certain irony that we've just sort of played out or explained in the last slide, uh, his first wife made him happy, made him very happy, but she may have been unfaithful. We never know for sure, but it's suggested, it's hinted that she may have been unfaithful. The second wife, on the other hand, very faithful, very morally upstanding, but she makes him unhappy. So there's an irony there. Some things of cause and effect. Well, his first wife, or his first marriage, excuse me, leads to happiness, and his first marriage also leads to financial success. But his wife's death 
then leads to unhappiness and to poverty. So cause some clear cause and effect there. Um, and there's other cause you know, events and, and things that are caused by that. Learning that the jewelry is wealth is real first causes him a great deal of anguish, but then causes him a great deal of pleasure because he gets to make the money. Getting all this money makes him very happy, but then it makes him unhappy because he marries an unpleasant woman. So again, cause and effect, very complicated. And just a figurative connection or a symbolic connection. Let's think about the fact that the wife loves theater and fake jewelry, or what we think is fake jewelry, and the fact that she has possibly been deceiving her husband, lying about where she's been going, possibly unfaithful. Think about the symbolic connections there. One, jewelry that is fake, although of course, again, as we find out, it's real, but jewelry that's fake is what? Something that's very beautiful, that appears to have a great deal of value, but is in fact not valuable. It's false. It's untrue. And think about theater. What is it that people do in the theater? Well, they act. They pretend. They pretend to be people that they are not. So thinking about how the wife's love of deception, perhaps, her love of pretending, is figuratively connected and might signal in some ways her infidelity or that aspect of her character. So let's look at a couple of plot summaries that I've written out here based on these details. This is how we might actually put these ideas into practice and write a short paragraph. So here's the first part of one plot summary. In the jewelry, Guy de Maupassant tells a story of a man whose life is ruined by his greed. So the very first sentence gives us an overview of the whole story. It's a man whose life is ruined by greed. That's the end of the story, essentially. And then it goes back and tells us, in this summary, we've got who the characters are and what happens. A young middle-class clerk named Lanton falls in love with and marries a poor young girl. They enjoy great happiness due particularly to her skill managing their financial accounts. The only conflict comes from Lanton's dislike of his wife's hobbies, of going to the theater, and collecting false jewelry. He refuses to accompany her and finds the jewelry tacky. So this gives us about the first half of the story. And then it goes on. The summary goes on. When his wife dies, Lanton suffers greatly from grief. He also falls into poverty and eventually tries to sell the fake jewelry. The jewelers reveal to him, however, that the jewelry is real. Lanton gets extremely upset, suspecting infidelity from his wife. But he decides that the money will comfort him and sells all the jewelry, growing more demanding as he does so. He celebrates, but ultimately marries a woman who is faithful but unpleasant, and his life is an unhappy one. That gives us an overview of the whole story. And notice that there's even a couple things that I've said here that are partly my interpretation. For example, suspecting infidelity from his wife. Lanton never comes out and says explicitly that he suspects her, but it seems that he suspects her of something, and he's clearly very upset by the idea that she had real jewelry. So I've made a few things explicit that are perhaps implicit in the story. But this summary, basically, it gives us the whole story, gives us the main characters, sets up the important irony and kind of reversals in a one short paragraph. Let's look at another summary, slightly different. The jewelry tells a tale of how a man suffers due to infidelity. Now notice here how this takes a different task, takes a different take on the uh, uh, story. The first summary said it's a story of a man whose uh, life is ruined due to greed. And this one, it's about a man suffering due to infidelity. So this is a different perspective on the story, a different interpretation in some sense, even though I'm going to go over the same main ideas. A young clerk named Lanton marries a young woman from a poor family after her mother arranges their courtship. Their marriage is a joyous one until Lanton grows tired of attending the theater with his wife. She begins to attend on her own and then buys a great deal of fake jewelry, which Lanton also does not like. 
What he does not know, however, is that the jewelry is real and very expensive and has been bought for his wife by an unknown person. So notice here how, in this summary, I'm also introducing the twist that the jewelry is real a little bit earlier in the summary because it's more important to the perspective I've take, I'm taking here. That Lanton has stopped going with his wife, that the jewelry is real, and he doesn't know it. She dies suddenly, and he grieves, suffering so much that he nearly dies. When his financial situation grows desperate, he tries to sell the jewels and learns the truth about them. Suspecting his wife's infidelity, he becomes distraught. Eventually, he tries to ease his grief by selling her jewels for a great deal of money, and then marries a woman whom he can trust to be faithful, but whose cruelty makes his life miserable. Now, this is a different summary. In some ways, it's a little bit more negative towards the first wife and her infidelity. And it's a little bit more um, insistent, suggestive that she really was being unfaithful, whereas the first summary left it a little bit more up in the air. So this is a different perspective. It's slightly a different take, all using the same facts from the story, but with a slightly different look at it because I'm focusing on different things that I think are important in this summary. So final questions, a wrap up in this lecture. How did the summaries take the same material and make something different from it? What is the what are the principles that made each summary slightly different, even though they're using the same ideas? Is one summary more or less correct than the other? Which one do you think better describes that story? How does the main idea notice again, the, the main thing that was different about those two was the main idea that I started the summary with. So how did that main idea shape and organize what came afterwards? When you read this story, think about your own interpretation. Do you think this is a story about greed? Do you think this is a story about infidelity? Do you think it's a story about something else? What is your interpretation? How does it differ from what I've presented here? And if it is different, how does that change the summary? How would that change what you wrote? So those are our last questions. We'll end with this lecture here, this presentation on writing about plot. I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next video.